Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alex White, Chair of the IIEA's Climate and Energy Working Group, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, which is part of the Rethink Energy series, organised, co-organised by the IIEA and the ESB. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank the ESB for their sponsorship of this series, and we'll hear from their Jerry O'Sullivan in a few moments. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Tim Gould, who's Chief Energy Economist of the International Energy Agency. And I'd like to thank Tim in advance for being uh, so generous with his time uh, to join us today. Tim Gould was appointed Chief Energy Economist of the International Energy Agency, the IEA, in 2021. In this role, he provides strategic advice on energy economics across a wide range of IEA activities uh, uh, and analysis. Mr. Gould is also head of the Division for Energy Supply and Investment Outlooks, in which capacity he co-leads the World Energy Outlook, the IEA's flagship uh, publication. At the IEA, he oversees the agency's work on investment and finance, including the World Energy Investment Report. He joined the IEA in 2008, initially as a specialist on Russian and Caspian energy. And prior to joining uh, the organization, he worked on European and Eurasian energy issues in Brussels and has 10 years of experience in Eastern Europe, primarily of note for us today in Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused a grave humanitarian crisis and has also had far reaching impacts on the global energy system, disrupting supply and demand patterns and fracturing uh, long-standing trade relationships. In his talk uh, today, Tim will examine the implications of this conflict for energy markets and prices, and will consider whether today's crisis will help or hinder efforts to tackle the world's critical challenge of reducing global greenhouse emissions quickly enough to avoid catastrophic climate change. Tim uh, will speak to us for 15 to 20 minutes or so, after which we'll move to a Q&A session. And you'll be able to join that discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see there on your screen and be well used to at this stage. Please feel free to send your questions in uh, throughout the session as they occur to you, rather than waiting until the uh, rush at the end, as it were. Please identify yourself and give, us, give any affiliation that you may have when uh, asking your question. Today's presentation and Q&A session are all on the record. If you're given to using Twitter, please feel free to do that. And you might like to use the hashtag at uh, hashtag Rethink Energy. First, however, allow me to introduce and welcome Jerry O'Sullivan, who's the Deputy Chief Executive of the ESB. And Jerry will now offer some opening remarks. You're very welcome, Jerry. Thanks, Alex, and good afternoon, everybody, and you're welcome. And on behalf of ESB, thanks for joining today to the latest event in our Rethink Energy Lecture Series in association with our partner, IIEA. We'd all rather hoped we wouldn't be having this conversation in the geopolitical environment we have today. Sadly, the situation in Ukraine has saddened us all, and we think of the tragedy and the the, the pain inflicted on Ukraine people. Their resilience is an, is an inspiration and our thoughts remain with them. But the conflict, I suppose, redoubles all of our efforts if such a thing shouldn't happen again. And I know Tim will talk about that in his discussion. Here in Ireland, the war has had an immediate hard hitting impact on households, cost of living, this, this disruption to supply chains, and in particular, energy bills which have risen hugely due to the skyrocketing wholesale energy prices, international prices. And that's been unprecedented. And the volatility of that in the past 12 months has been unprecedented and sadly set to continue. We cannot fix that overnight, but as a country, and certainly we in ESB are committed to reducing our reliance on fossil fuel and to drive to become a net zero society and thus reducing the dependency on those international volatile markets. At ESB, our strategy driven to make a difference net zero by 2040, which we launched earlier this year, uh, builds on our previous brighter future strategy. But that strategy places a renewed focus on ESG, 
UN climate goals, using science-based targets to reduce greenhouse gases, and setting a goal for ESB group to be net zero by 2040. Certainly very challenging, but we think also very exciting. And in our company, we're really committed to making a difference. So shortly, we'll be announcing a very significant recruitment campaign to help us accelerate our strategy. Zero carbon electricity will play a huge part. We're targeting a five-fold increase in renewable generation to five gigawatts by 2030. This will be done by expanding offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar. And of course, hydrogen, which we had as a topic in this series before, green hydrogen, battery storage, and microgeneration will play a pivotal role in helping us to get to a zero carbon society. We need to deploy these strategies and more, and these technologies at a massive scale and at an urgency not seen before if we are really serious about making a difference. We simply have to. So I think it's a very different environment for all of us. And uh, I think a fitting background for Tim's discussion today. So I'm eagerly waiting Tim's comments. And on behalf of ESB, I'd like to thank you, Tim, for joining us today and look forward to your comments. Over to you, Tim. Nice to have you. Well, thank you so much, um, Alex, and thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for those um, opening words. I mean, the, the IEA, I, I feel a, somehow a kinship with the IEA, uh, but um, I, just a word on our institution. Um, we were created almost 50 years ago in the midst of another energy shock. So after the first oil shock in, the, in 1973, the IEA was created as a way to try and mitigate energy security vulnerabilities. Um, and perhaps there are some parallels which we can come back to between the energy crisis that we saw in the 1970s and the one that we're having today. I think there are some parallels, but there are some important differences as well. And um, the shocks in the 1980s were really, uh, the 1970s, apologies, were really all about oil. And I think today we are in the world's first global energy crisis because we're dealing with Russia and Russia, as I think we're all aware, uh, is not just a huge exporter of oil, but also the world's largest exporter of gas. And indeed, from a European perspective, um, has been also Europe's uh, largest source of um, imported uh, coal. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put a few slides up on the screen. And um, where am I? There we are. Can you see all the, can you see those slides okay? Great. And um, um, talk you through at least some, some thoughts from the IEA on how we got here and, and where we might go from here. Um, I think a first thing to have in mind when you're considering um, the price, the affordability crisis, the cost of living crisis, is that um, you know, markets were tight well before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So you're looking at a variety of price indices. TTF is the main European hub for, uh, for traded natural gas. Um, there's the price of EU imported coal. Um, and let's also have in mind that, uh, you know, insofar as gas is moving all over the place, that has a very strong implications also then for electricity prices. Uh, and you can see that correlation there with the, uh, with the indices for, for, for German uh, power. Um, but only the last of these spikes on the screen is unambiguously related to Russia's invasion. I mean, there have been all sorts of strains on supply chains uh, well in advance of that. And I think the other thing to say up front is that events are moving quite fast. Um, you know, things that were off the table a few weeks ago are very much on the table now. Um, we've had um, the announcement that Russia has stopped gas deliveries to Poland and Bulgaria uh, because of uh, disputes over payment for gas um, in rubles. And um, there's now a Russian presidential decree, uh, the details of which are being put together, uh, which allows Russia to, um, to stop the export of products and raw materials to entities deemed unfriendly. Um, there's a continued discussion, of course, over a new round of EU sanctions. Uh, and we've had the first signs of disruptions also to the flow of, of gas in transit. Uh, through Ukraine. So I think an initial key message is we are in a new world of energy. We're not going to go back to where 
uh, to where we were. Um, I don't think there's any need to linger here, but just a, a reminder of the importance of Russia in global energy. It is a huge player. And so it's not at all simple uh, for the world or for Europe if supplies of this magnitude uh, are disrupted. And we've seen already some quite significant import bans being put in place. Um, for example, the bans on imported oil from the US, from the UK, and a few other countries, that's already affecting roughly 13% of Russian oil exports. And we've seen that even in advance of um, formal sanctions from the European Union, uh, many trading houses, shippers, insurers, international players in the oil industry are all backing away from doing business visibly uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia. And it cannot be taken for granted that energy exports that are displaced from Europe um, will find a home elsewhere. Uh, and we can't, of course, rule out also further restrictions from the Russian side as well as from, uh, from, from countries elsewhere. So global energy supply is effectively being reduced, and that has significant implications then for global energy security, affordability, trade, uh, and the economy. And I'll come back to the question about what this means uh, for, for, for transitions. Um, but just as a sort of headline, um, in my view, um, today's disruption, today's energy crisis is very likely to be an accelerant for energy transitions in many parts of Europe. Um, elsewhere, I think there are a few questions. Um, it's not completely clear that you'll have the policies in place that can channel today's sort of economic advantages of clean energy into that surge in deployment. And it could be, in some cases, that today's crisis could be a spur for countries to double down on, on fossil fuels. So we need to be aware of some potential regional variations in uh, the response to today's crisis. Um, a couple of words on, on oil. Um, the key question in oil markets is how fast you see a reorientation of international trade. What happens to Russian supply? And what are the implications then for prices and Russia's revenues? Now, in the past, you've had a very stable relationship between the price of Brent crude oil and the price of oil from the, from the Urals region of Russia. And also then, if you put on top of this, the margins for um, producers of diesel in the refining sector, and the, the margins have typically been, you know, small, um, but all of that has changed since the Russian invasion. So you'd have this real broadening of differentials. Um, and I think one first point, if you're an analyst of energy, but even if you're not an analyst of energy, you typically look at the crude price as the first indication of where the market is. Um, I think you need to look at a range of indicators today because some of the tightest markets are in those refined products, for diesel in particular, um, but also uh, for gasoline. And for a change, it's actually quite a profitable moment to be in the, in, in, in the refining business, particularly if your input crude is, is a heavily discounted Russian crude. Um, where do we go from here? I think there's a few things to watch. Um, there are clearly clouds on the horizon for the, for the global economy. Um, high prices will take their toll. Um, you know, incidences of COVID in China uh, are also dampening uh, the uh, global demand uh, for oil. But on the other hand, additional EU sanctions could, could accelerate some of the things we're, we're seeing already, accelerate that move away from, uh, from Russian oil coming into Europe and, and uh, displacing it in part to other markets. That could force uh, Russian oil companies to shut in more wells. And in our latest oil market report, uh, we say that by the second half of, uh, of this year, then Russian oil production could be about 3 million barrels a day uh, below where it was um, prior to the invasion. But the thing I'd like us to watch out for in terms of the near-term impact of all of this is that we're heading into the summer. Now, the summer in the Northern Hemisphere is typically when you have a significant uptick in consumption, um, and that could coincide with a reduction in Russian supply. So if refiners can't keep pace, um, disruptions to oil product exports uh, escalate, and um, you could see some quite significant strains on 
um, product markets this summer, even above the sorts of prices that we're already seeing today. A couple of words on, um, on, on gas. And I think gas, even more than oil, is where the most difficult questions lie. And um, because Russia's ability to switch existing European gas supplies to other markets is much more limited than in the case of oil. Um, but so too is uh, Europe's ability to rapidly find alternative supplies or to reduce uh, demand. And what you're looking at on the screen is something that we came out with uh, within a week of the invasion, what we call the 10 point plan for limiting EU reliance on Russian gas imports. And what, this is roughly what we think could be done within uh, 12 months to bring down that reliance on Russian gas imports. There's a certain amount that can be done on the supply side by switching to alternative suppliers of gas. But the real hard yards and the most important tasks, I think, are on the gas demand side. And, and I, I think you'd see a, long, a, a very strong alignment with this kind of messaging um, tomorrow when the European Commission comes out with its Repower EU, the details of that Repower um, EU uh, plan. And so I think when, you know, very important parts of this debate in terms of the response from the European side needs to be how quickly can you move to alternative uh, alternatives for, for heating homes and industrial heat and, and how fast can you, um, can you reduce reliance on gas um, in, in the power sector uh, as well. Um, LNG is a big part of the discussion, um, but I, a, word of, a word of caution here about how much flexibility there really is in the international gas market. I mean, LNG is inherently flexible, um, but we know roughly how much additional LNG capacity there's going to be over the coming years. These are big projects. They take a long time from the investment decision to the start of LNG production. And so the amount of additional LNG that's coming into the market over the next few years is already pretty clear. And if you look in the early 20s, and there's a couple of fallow years, it's only really in the middle of this decade when you get big new additional volumes uh, coming to market um, from North America, but also uh, from Qatar. A couple of words on the, the patterns of European gas uh, consumption, because Europe's gas infrastructure comprises an annual delivery capacity, um, which is nearly twice that of the electricity grid on an energy equivalent basis. So the, the peak in winter of gas demand is roughly twice that of the summer, uh, and it's even higher in more temperate parts of, uh, of the EU. And um, if I click through here, you can start to see the composition of that. And then all of that seasonal variability then comes uh, from the uh, residential sector. Um, and that points to some of the challenges that Europe will face in reducing um, its, its gas demand. Um, what the, one of the key elements here is to get efficiency in play so you can reduce some of those winter peaks. And that also reduces strains on the gas storage system, which allows you to meet those seasonal variations in demand. Um, but let's also be aware that when it comes to moving away from gas, you, you can move away from gas in aggregate, but the nature of our energy system is such that um, you, you can reduce your overall gas demand, but when you need it, you really need it. So um, in our projections that, look out to say 2030, um, even in systems that are changing rapidly, you get a reduction in overall demand. Um, but in terms of your peak needs for gas in systems that are retiring coal and installing ever more solar and, and, uh, and, and wind, um, those peak needs uh, continue to rise. And um, I think that has important implications for the way that we think about gas and um, gas security. So we are not going to quickly delink gas security from uh, electricity uh, security. Um, in these concluding slides, I'd like to just set a slightly broader set of, 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 of sort of bits of context about the discussion on energy markets, emissions, uh, and uh, investment, and also some of the changing 
sort of energy security and geopolitical considerations that we might see through transitions. Um, just to introduce a little bit where we see emissions going, and um, that's roughly where emissions were heading prior to the Paris Agreement, but we've already had quite a significant reduction in that kind of baseline set of assumptions because technologies have got cheaper, policies have become stronger uh, since the Paris Agreement in 2015. And then in Glasgow last year, we got a further round of new commitments from governments. And if you take governments at their word and imagine that they will implement all of those commitments, including net zero commitments, then you start to see quite a significant reduction in global energy related CO2 emissions to 2050. That though is still not enough to get us to that sort of 1.5 degree stabilization, that net zero by 2050 goal and that we wrote about in a, a roadmap, which was published almost um, exactly uh, one year ago. So that's a little bit the overall framing for the climate challenge. Um, and within that, there's a very important message from our side about investment, because we are simply not putting enough capital globally into the energy sector in order to shift us onto a new uh, trajectory. And we're also not spending enough to maintain current patterns of consumption. So if we look at oil and gas upstream investment worldwide, that's come down by half since 2014. And it's one of the very few indicators that actually consistent with that net zero um, scenario. Um, but if we look worldwide at the amounts going into clean energy, um, we are not spending nearly enough on building up efficient, clean energy sources uh, and infrastructure um, in ways that would allow us to meet rising demand for energy services in a sustainable way. And this mismatch is a real risk factor for the future because it points to uh, the potential for future uh, price spikes and volatility in addition to the things that we're seeing today. Um, a final set of considerations is around international trade. Um, I think as we're all aware, international energy trade is dominated at the moment by oil. Um, but if we click through some of the things that happen during energy transitions, uh, especially when we think through the implications of a net zero scenario, then the role of hydrocarbons in international trade obviously diminishes. Um, the overall volume of trade comes down, but um, you see a new set of characters emerging um, and the critical minerals that we need for a variety of clean energy technologies. So that's the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel, and the rare earth elements that go into the technologies that we need and the batteries that we're gonna need. Um, they all become an important part of the picture. And so we shouldn't imagine that sort of the geopolitical concerns or about concentration of supply uh, disappear completely as we move away uh, from fossil fuels. And the other element here, which I think is very important, is the idea that we won't simply be producing hydrogen at home. Uh, we will also be, a, be importing it, uh, hydrogen and hydrogen rich fuels uh, from countries that have advantages in, uh, on the production side because of abundant renewables, or in some cases, um, because uh, they are producing hydrogen from natural gas with uh, carbon capture utilization and storage. And the final message about the clean energy economy and the size of the uh, opportunities that might arise. Um, if you think through five types of equipment that are associated with uh, clean energy transitions, um, and you can see them on the right of the screen, and you see what the market opportunity in those sectors looks like over the coming decades. Um, you can see that by 2050, that's well over a trillion dollars each year in terms of the size of that market. And that's roughly equivalent to where the oil market was in 2020. So there are huge opportunities here for countries and for companies that are well positioned in those uh, clean energy value chains. And where those chains are and how um, countries manage to capture different bits of value and how they compete for that market, I think is gonna be an increasingly important element in the uh, geopolitics of energy uh, both wild, worth, worldwide um, and, of course, uh, in Europe as well. And with that, I think I would, I would leave it there and look forward very much to hearing uh, your reactions uh, and questions. Thank you very much, Tim. That, that's just fascinating, um, just to, to put us in the picture. 
if I may say so, so efficiently uh, uh, and to, to summarize the kind of the big questions that we're facing. Uh, I, as you said, we'll find out a little bit more tomorrow um, in, uh, about what the commission is proposing and more specifically perhaps than uh, we have to date. Um, but do you think just as a start off question, I mean, the EU has pledged to reduce Russian gas imports by two thirds, I think it is by the end of this year, 2022, which is a big, a big ask. How feasible, how realistic does that feel to you? I mean, it's clearly very challenging. There's, uh, there's, no, there's no two ways about that. Um, you know, if you compare our 10 point plan with the initial repower um, sort of communication um, announcement, um, the elements in play are basically the same. Um, you know, you have to either reduce demand for gas or you have to find non-Russian supply. Um, and reducing demand for gas is, I mean, simple conceptually, um, but just quite difficult to, to manage in practice because it means scaling up all sorts of things that are by nature quite difficult to do. Home insulation, you know, retrofitting homes, um, bringing in heat pumps instead of gas-fired boilers. Um, and in, 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 in industry, there is also quite limited flexibility, at least in the, in the, in the short term. Um, on the supply side, um, I think there are a couple of elements here that we would wish to emphasize that perhaps haven't found their way into the debate as much as they could have done. Um, everyone is very focused on suppliers, you know, suppliers of LNG, suppliers of pipeline gas. But let's not forget, there are huge volumes of gas around the world that are currently being flared. Um, the World Bank just recently came out with numbers, nearly 150 billion cubic meters of gas is flared each year. Um, and that happens to be uh, roughly equivalent or only just shy of the amount of uh, gas that Russia uh, exports uh, to the European Union. On top of that, um, there is a lot of gas that leaks, just simply leaks to the atmosphere uh, in the form of methane, and that has very damaging effects on near-term warming, as we see from the IPCC scenarios. Um, so we feel that you could start to look at some of those sources of gas, not just from a waste perspective or for an environmental perspective, but through an energy security lens as well. Let's really go after some of that gas, which is currently being produced, uh, but is simply being wasted. Uh, and then, you know, there, there may be opportunities there uh, for, for, for additional gas to be brought to market in different parts of the world. Just, I was very taken by um, what you said uh, about the, this mismatch in terms of investment. So we've seen a really dramatic fall in investment in um, oil and gas, but as you said, not anything like the kind of investment that would be needed to satisfy the, you know, the replacement that's required uh, to, to, to happen. Um, and I, it was kind of linked to another thing that I, I felt was, 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 was sort of on my mind in relation to gas infrastructure, particularly in Europe, and it's a debate that we have here in Ireland as well. But obviously a lot of the political kind of, the, the, the political um, pushback has been against new infrastructure. We say from, you know, from, I was going to say from the left, but I mean, from those who think that we should be moving more quickly towards uh, decarbonization, the, 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 the conventional kind of wisdom now is that if that's what you're for, well, then you should be for the phasing out of infrastructure and certainly not the building of new infrastructure. But how do you reconcile that with what seems to be what you're saying is that, look, no matter what way we look at this, we're going to need we are going to need some new infrastructure. The LNG is obviously a critical element to what we need to do, given the Russian, the, the, the Ukrainian situation. So is there, I'm just wondering, how do we reconcile, I mean, it's a big question. How do we reconcile the need for new infrastructure with the imperative to phase out infrastructure? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great, it's really a great question. And, um, and it comes to us a lot uh, in large part also because in the analysis on our net zero roadmap by 2050 that we produced a year ago, um, the reductions in oil and gas demand that are required to hit that 1.5 degree stabilization are sufficiently steep. Um, you know, you need to scale up efficiency, scale up alternative ways of meeting, you know, the demand for mobility and for heat and everything else. And that has such large implications then for oil and gas demand that in that scenario, um, you could meet um, the residual oil and gas demand just from continued investment in existing fields. So we don't have any new fields 
approved in that scenario after the end of 2021. Now, two qualifiers there. I mean, we're clearly not yet in that scenario. Many people would like us to get there, but you know, look at the energy trends. We had record CO2 emissions in uh, 2021. You know, coal demand was buoyant last year. Um, so we're not yet on that on track for that scenario. Um, but in addition, now we have um, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, uh, which could mean that some Russian resources in Western Siberia, in the Yamal Peninsula, that would normally have come to Europe, are going to stay there because there's no other markets that they can reach. So even in, in that kind of scenario where people are switching out of an existing resource, um, you know, in a net zero world, you would still need some additional uh, investment. And, and so um, the executive director wrote in a, in, a, in a post at the end of last week, uh, you can see it on, on LinkedIn. So we try to address that dilemma. So how do you, how do you get it? How do you, um, what do you invest in under those circumstances? And in our view, um, you know, they, if you need to invest, then there's a number of sort of short cycle options that you can, uh, that you can look at. Um, they might be shale, um, they might be some tie-ins to existing fields. Um, there might be some other things that bring um, oil and gas to market relatively quickly. However, where you have to be much more wary, especially in a world that's heading for, uh, that's aiming for net zero by 2050, is over very longer term, long lived infrastructure. And um, because if you're investing in that now, that implies one of two things: either it's going to be used and we're going to break through the carbon budget consistent with climate ambitions, or you know, eventually we, we get to grips with our climate challenge and demand comes down, and that is, those assets uh, are at risk of not returning their original investment. So I think we have to make a distinction between different types of response to the current, uh, to the current crisis. But in any case, uh, the emphasis from our side would be, let's Let's not just look at the supply side of this. Let's really focus on the things that we need to do uh, in order to tackle uh, the demand for fuels. Sarah Taft McGuire um, from the Sunday, or from the Business Post, I, they, they stopped calling it the Sunday Business Post quite a while ago. I better be careful. It's the Business Post. And Sarah asks, why is it that we are not putting enough capital globally into the renewable energy sector? Why do you think that is, and what can be done about it? I think the first thing to say is that, you know, that slide, I mean, the, the mismatch there is not just about renewables. It's about all sorts of things that we need for energy transition. So it could be infrastructure, it could be grids, it could be all sorts of investments in energy efficiency, as well as low carbon fuels and renewables. Um, why are we not putting enough money into them? Um, I think most of the barriers are really non-market. So um, right now, with fossil fuel prices where they are, um, even things that were considered to be, uh, you know, quite expensive, clean options a, a year or two ago are now um, uh, looking much more attractive. And the ones that were already cost competitive before the today's crisis are looking even more uh, cost competitive. Um, we're not putting enough capital into it, I think, because many countries still lack the vision that would enable them to put in place the policies that would then attract uh, capital into those uh, sectors. Um, and you know the, the, the barriers could be very different in different parts of the world. But typically, if you're talking about utility scale renewables, um, then there's often questions about permitting. Um, there's often questions about the remuneration of those investments and how much confidence the investors have in it over time. And it's particularly true um, in many emerging and developing economies. And then the final point is that um, the gap that needs to be filled is smaller in a, in, a, in a part of the world like Europe, but it is much larger in many uh, developing economies. And let's remember that these economies are also facing a debt crisis, they're facing a public health crisis, they're facing an economic crisis. Um, and in many parts of the world, they're also facing now uh, a, a very severe um, energy crisis. I mean, just look at what's happening in, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, in some other parts of South Asia, uh, where countries are really struggling with the import bills. So in a way, the current crisis reinforces the arguments in favor of transition, but also comes somehow saps the resources and the political attention 
that is necessary in order to, to, to deal with it in a structured and sustainable way. And actually, you made that point in the presentation that you know, the crisis will be an accelerant for the transition, perhaps in Europe and uh, other parts uh, of the world, but there will be there will be significant regional um, variations in that. And you seem to imply, or I think you said that it, it, it might even cause a reversal in some in some conditions around the world, in some countries around the world. I think we are worried about that. And if you look at um, some of the things that happened in the 1970s, so in the 1970s, the political the policy response to high energy prices was a period of huge innovation. So you saw a great push for higher efficiency in many areas. I mean, for example, the average fuel efficiency of a, of a new car sold in the United States at the beginning of the 1970s was around 18 liters for, uh, per 100 kilometers. By the end of that decade, it was much closer uh, to 10 liters. So you had a, a response from manufacturers, you had a response from policy. Um, but one of the other things you saw in the 1970s was a big build out of coal in, in, many, in many economies. And some of that coal is still operating today. Uh, and so we need to be very wary of uh, you know, a repeat performance uh, today, particularly for countries that have uh, large uh, indigenous resources uh, that can be tapped into uh, relatively easily. Okay, Paul Dean, um, who's a research uh, fellow at uh, University uh, College Cork, says wonderful, insightful presentation. He thanks you for that, and he's wondering what are what are Tim's views on an EU-wide gas price cap? Yeah, there's a lot of um, ideas around about how we can, in a sense, manage this gas price crisis. And let's let's remember that it is a, a gas crisis it's not an electricity crisis it's not a renewable crisis um, but for the you know for, for, for most of Europe you're feeling uh, uh, the effects of, of those extremely high prices in natural gas and I think um, that there are some in some quite you know interesting arguments about the way that you could uh, you could manage that um, but I think we need to be wary of some contradictions here between different policy aims um, because if you're capping the price of gas within Europe, um, you're also probably capping Europe's ability to bring in alternative support, supplies of gas from other sources uh, and move away uh, quickly from, from Russia. So you need to find a way to, to square various uh, circles. Um, I think there's also um, uh, you know, various proposals for, um, for amending the design of Euro the operation of European um, electricity markets. Um, because you know the high price of gas is feeding through into very high wholesale prices for, for, for electricity as well. And there I have some sympathy with the arguments put forward by um, ASA, which is an agency for cooperation amongst um, European regulators based in, um, in, in Slovenia. And they say, well, uh, um, there is a risk of, of, of hasty decision making here. Um, we need to try and think through um, solutions that are uh, that are sustainable and also meet Europe's own decarbonisation um, uh, 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 needs. Um, one of the things that gas does in the European energy system is it provides flexibility. And one of the things that you need to do in order to succeed in transitions is to bring forward additional sustainable ways of managing those seasonal variations in electricity demand. And some of those are relatively expensive at the moment. And so if you're capping the price of gas, you're also potentially um, removing some of the incentives for people to come in uh, with alternative ways of, of managing that flexibility. So there's a couple of thoughts there, um, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a fast-moving field, that one. Hmm. Uh, Jane Massey, um, who's an um, IIEA member, we need to be careful of the IEAs here because we've just there's only just one little letter between us and you. So we're the IIEA, you're the IEA. Jane Massey, who's one of our members, asks, what about nuclear? A, a commendably um, pithy question. Um, John Feely is on the same question. What role will nuclear play in the future? Fission and fusion. That's John Feely of the Leitrim Labour Party. And I'm just wondering... 
just to tie that up, I mean, the obviously the decision that the Germans made some some years ago, how does that decision look now? I don't know if the IEA makes a comment on specific decisions made by individual governments, but it just it, you know, put it this way, it's 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 possible to to look at that decision with it from from a radically as necessary to look at that decision from a radically different perspective today. So I think nuclear is a really interesting one, and it's a it's a question that we focus a lot on at uh, here at IA headquarters. So first thing to say is that a lot of the nuclear forty percent of the nuclear facilities that are in operation today were built after the first oil shocks in the nineteen seventies as part of that policy response to um, to 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 the to the high prices. So let's have in mind the the ways in which high prices can also you know, create a, a surge in deployment of, of, uh, of new technologies. Um, the second thing is because the 70s are, you know, nearly 50 years ago, um, those reactors are getting old. So there are discussions underway in many countries about that, that, that wave of reactors um, are facing retirement. Many of the reactors that were built in advanced economies are, are now facing decisions about lifetime extensions or, or retirement. Uh, and so the IEA position is, let's not ignore the possibilities to safely extend the lifetimes of some of those uh, facilities, because it seems to us that if you can do it safely, then you have a very large uh, source of low emissions generation that can also help with some of today's energy security worries. Um, and indeed, this was part of our, our, our analysis, part of our 10 point plan, and um, you know, the uh, the decisions that were taken in Belgium, for example, to revisit the timetable for phasing out some of those plants, um, in, in our view, seemed uh, to be um, um, reasoned and reasonable ways of proceeding. Now, the other big question for us um, is it takes us to the other side of the world. Uh, because if you're looking at the balance in LNG markets, um, one of the big variables then is how quickly do some of the Japanese reactors that have received sort of regulatory approval, how, how quickly do they move back um, into operation? And because indeed, if they can uh, move back into operation relatively quickly, that could be very significant also in easing strains on LNG markets. Um, and when we talk about the future of, of nuclear, um, uh, you see that coming back into the conversation in, in, in many countries, although of course not in all, um, that seems to us to be um, a very interesting phenomenon, um, also from a technology perspective, um, because there's all sorts of quite creative ideas now about how new wave of nuclear investment can be made more compatible with the sort of electricity markets that we're likely to see in future. So big, new, large scale, capital intensive um, nuclear projects that need to run at very high levels of utilization. And that's not necessarily a good match for systems that are going to be very rich in onshore and offshore wind and solar. But smaller, as they put it, modular reactors um, could be a much better fit for those kinds of systems. And there's all sorts of interesting thinking going on about how we can start to deploy a different model of, uh, of nuclear power for the future. And indeed, in a few months' time, uh, we'll be coming out with our own thoughts on this with some new analysis from the IEA. Um, thanks for that. Three sort of quick comments stroke questions, which are more probably peculiar to Ireland. So but I'll put them to you, but they, they may be more general insights that you, you might have that, uh, you know, applying to countries that are relatively speaking peripheral location wise. Brigadier General Ahern, Ger Ahern, who's a member of the IAEA, he said the Republic of Ireland imports 65% of its gas needs through two pipelines originating in the United Kingdom. If these two pipelines were to become unserviceable for any of a ver variety of possible disruptive events, what alternatives do we have for replacing these imports? I think that it's a question, but it's perhaps somewhat rhetorical as well. And um, then um, Barry O'Dowd, I suppose similar, as an island economy, how exposed is Ireland to market vagaries? Um, and then the third one, um, looking at the new global energy economy, Bill Boucher uh, asks, how or where does biomethane sit as an option, and particularly given Ireland's potential position in this field? So I'll just put those three and, you, you know, do the best you can perhaps address some of those, have some th thoughts on some of those points. Well, I personally feel that the, 
the third question provides a partial answer to the first two, um, in a sense mm. that one of the things that countries can do um, to increase their, their gas security is to look at building up um, low carbon gas supply. Um, and Ireland is a country that clearly has a significant uh, potential in that in that area, and indeed is is, is putting policies in place to to uh, to take advantage of that. Um, one of the things that, uh, but, but but it's clear that if you're a country that is heavily reliant on imports of gas and those imports are disrupted, um, then in the near term, you don't have a huge degree of, uh, of flexibility. Um, and indeed, we very much hope that Europe doesn't face um, a similar dilemma, uh, you know, in the period up to, to next winter. Um, but it's true that if it does, then your, your, your options are, are, are indeed quite limited because gas markets are not built for flexibility. They are, there is no spare reserve of gas in which, which, you can, which you can tap into. It's quite expensive to store. It's quite expensive uh, to transport. So by and large, um, any gas delivery system is, is sort of sized for the market need. I mean, it doesn't have much, uh, doesn't have much room uh, for, 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 for contingencies in there. Um, and, and, and of course, that's why gas has traditionally been quite a strategic and indeed sort of political commodity in, 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 in some ways. Um, so I think the, you know, as an island nation, um, I'm aware of course of the debates about uh, the potential for um, an LNG import facility. And many countries are looking at that as a way of giving themselves additional flexibility, either as a, a sort of permanent onshore facility or, or, a, a, or a floating uh, offshore facility. Um, but again, I, you know, we, Bring people back to the discussion around, you know, your long-term goals. In our view, there are plenty of ways in which you can, you know, react to the current energy security crisis that move you also in the direction and that you need to go anyway um, to meet uh, the uh, climate imperatives. And so we are very much encouraging countries to think through that alignment um, as they consider their responses to the current crisis. Thank you for um, for that. Um, so Emmanuel Ferrari asks um, how the projected increase in energy hungry data centers is going to play out against the need to reduce fossil fuel demand and the transition uh, towards renewable uh, for a carbon neutral economy. Sorry, my there we are. My, oh, back come on again. Yeah, um, yeah data is. I mean, it's true that energy data centers are now on the map as a uh, as a source of um, uh, of electricity demand, as a significant source of electricity demand in, in in some countries in the world. And again, Ireland's one of those. And um, I think that um, well, there's two things that I think are quite important. Um, one is that there's been a huge increase in the efficiency of some of these uh, many of these operations. Um, so some of the charts that you could see a few years ago that showed um, data center electricity consumption just skyrocketing. I mean, they simply haven't come to pass um, because of the efficiency measures uh, that have been implemented. I think the other consideration is that, you know, data, digitalization, that's, that's going to be a big part of our, of our societies, of our economies, but also of our energy system in the future. You know, we are moving towards a more electrified and so in some sense data-driven a way of managing our energy affairs. Um, and so um, I don't feel that we have necessarily a, you know, a choice whether to move in that direction or not. I mean, I have views on, on the use of large amounts of electricity for Bitcoin mining, but I mean, that, that's a slightly separate issue here. Um, you know, we are gonna be heading in that direction and I think we need to find ways to you know, mitigate any potential downsides uh, through efficiency and through the use of, uh, of clean electricity. Um, rather than thinking that we, you know, that we, we, we that we have a reasonable choice not to go in that direction as a society. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions here, which I think are probably belong, may well belong together. But anyway, you might think differently. David Kelly, what technology solution do you expect to provide backup for intermittent renewables 15 to 20 years from now, when the decarbonisation agenda has got to be mature in order for us to uh, reach net zero? And he comments, battery technology seems to be high cost 
high in terms of demand for natural resources and doesn't offer long-term utility power despite sectoral development. And um, perhaps not quite on the same point, but with the same sorts of issues in mind, um, Sarah Thap Foley from Gas Networks Ireland wonders whether you have a view on what would be the least cost option for Europe to reach decarbonisation goals while also ensuring security of supply and affordability for end users, which is a general question that touches on many of the issues you, you've, been, uh, you've been considering. So I think as a general principle, for, in answer to the second question, yeah. is that you, know, you need to get clean electricity into as many parts of your energy system as you can. I mean, that seems to be at least a cost option um, alongside improvements in efficiency. Uh, for large parts of the of the energy system. However, there are limits to what clean electricity can do, or there are limits to what it can do directly. Um, there are some parts of the energy economy where you simply need to find alternative uh, solutions. So in our net zero roadmap, if you look at the, the, the nature of the energy system in 2050, roughly half of final consumption, so the consumption that comes from consumers like ourselves or industrial consumers, Roughly half of that consumption is in the form of electricity, but half is still in the form of fuels of different kinds, I mean, mostly uh, low carbon fuels. So we need to be thinking also about what the solutions are in that space that is occupied by fuels. Now, some of that is in a way clean electricity appearing in disguise. So you turn that clean electricity into molecules, mostly clean hydrogen, that then is uh, used in various end use sectors, uh, particularly long distance transportation or bits of industry um, where, um, where that's a, 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 suitable, um, uh, a suitable way of, of managing the needs of those sectors. Um, there are also openings for biofuels, um, there's openings for um, biogases uh, of different kinds, and, 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 and we, can, uh, we can discuss the precise composition of which bits fit, which bits fit best in different parts of the energy sector, if, if needs be. Um, but one of the implications of moving to a system that's more reliant on clean electricity is that the demand for flexibility goes up, um, and that's both short-term flexibility um, of the sort that can be provided by batteries, but also longer term flexibility, seasonal flexibility of the source of the sort that as the questioner mentioned, and batteries may not be suitable for. So you need to bring into play all sorts of technologies that help you manage different bits of that flexibility need. Now, batteries are good for short term, um, for short term needs. Um, but I think there is going to be a lot a premium on um, sort of dispatchable low emissions generation by which I mean things like hydropower, geothermal, uh, bioenergy used flexibly, um, and various other um, technologies and ideas that are in play. There's also going to be a premium on ways that you can store energy uh, long term. Um, and hydrogen, again, could be an answer um, for some of that, because it allows you to, to store chemically rather than in batteries. And then you can, you can use that energy uh, when you need it. So I think. Um, we're going to need to come up with a variety of new ways to manage that flexibility on the supply side. Um, but let's not ignore also the potential for flexibility on energy demand, uh, because increasingly we will be called upon as consumers to respond to price signals or to allow other people to respond on our behalf and to manage aspects of our own electricity consumption in particular in ways that meet the needs. Uh, of the grid. Now that's a question of trust, and that trust is going to be, uh, you know, difficult to gain and, and, and easy to lose. And um, but I think we we should we should be aware that that's going to be an important element of uh, of tomorrow's energy system as well. Absolutely, um, Kieran Murphy. Um, now it's got the name Kieran Murphy, but then it says Neil O'Leary from Kodima. Dublin's energy agency, it was mentioned that critical minerals will play a pivotal role in reaching net zero by 2050. The vast majority of these minerals come from countries outside of Europe, many which pose a supply risk to the European Union. Is there a strategy to increase domestic production of these minerals and decrease this supply risk? which could destabilize our goals. And actually on the same point, Emily Binchy, who's a researcher here at the IIEA, justice researcher, 
Um, how do you see the geopolitical landscape shifting in light of the increase in demand for critical minerals needed to meet the net zero target? Could this tilt the balance of power uh, towards China in the US-China energy competition duality? So the geopolitical question, and then whether we could start producing some of these critical minerals uh, ourselves. Yeah, I think that, I mean, those two questions are, are clearly linked um, in the sense that there is, there are geopolitical concerns. These concerns are real. Um, um, if you look at the supply chains for many of the uh, minerals and metals that we need for clean energy technologies, um, there is a ex very significant degree of concentration and much higher than we have in today's oil and gas industry, for example, uh, and particularly in the midstream areas. So the refining and processing of many of these minerals and metals uh, China has an extremely powerful position. Um, and let's not be, let's not misunderstand why it has such a powerful position. Um, you know, it has a powerful position because it has a very large domestic clean energy manufacturing, uh, you know, infrastructure that, that needs supply. And so China has invested heavily um, in those uh, midstream assets and also invested in the extractive side in many parts of the world. Um, but if you look at the extractive areas, then, you know, typically, there is uh, more than 50% of production comes from uh, you know, a handful of, of producers. So uh, there is a, a big debate underway as to how countries can diversify their supply, um, how much of that can be brought back to, in a sense, um, um, there's a discussion about friendshoring. So to brought back to countries which are, uh, in a sense, uh, geopolitical um, allies. And within the IA family, there are certainly countries that have significant uh, mineral resources. Just look at Australia, Canada, the United States, among others. I think what, what's needed is a number of things. Um, uh, you know, we haven't, we're not yet used to the idea that we, we may need to sort of mine our way to a clean energy future. There's a, there's a resistance to the idea that the extractive industries will be part of the, uh, of the solution. And also many of these processing and midstream assets, um, one of the reasons why they don't happen in Europe or in North America is because they are by their nature, they are quite polluting, they're quite dirty. A lot of that stuff has been outsourced to other parts of the world. Um, and if we're gonna bring them back, we need to have a debate about how we can ensure um, high standards of environmental governance, as well as um, all the social um, uh, you know, implications of bringing potentially dirty um, sectors uh, back into uh, our home economies. But I think there is a, a security of supply imperative to think these things through and to try and ensure that we have sufficient diversity and security amongst these value chains. And because any calculation that you do about demand for lithium, for nickel, um, for, for all of the elements that go into batteries and to electric motors and to various other bits of magnets that you need for wind turbines and so on, Whichever way you look at the future, if we are serious about meeting our climate goals, demand for those minerals and metals uh, will go up uh, very substantially. Um, we produced some analysis last year. If you take everything together, you get a sort of six times higher uh, value by the, by the, by the, 90, by the 2040s. Um, but for some, for lithium in particular, you, know, that they, you have sort of 30 or 40 times today's uh, demand from the energy sector. So one final element on this is that uh, we shouldn't confuse um, the security around those critical mineral value chains with the sort of worries that we have today about oil security. It's a different phenomenon. Um, you know, if you're short of lithium, if you're short of battery grade nickel, as you are at the moment, because a lot of that comes from Russia, um, you know, that affects the cost of building new stuff. It doesn't affect the cost of me running my electric car today. Um, so it's a very different sort of category from right. the idea of an oil supply shop, which doesn't just affect new buyers of, of um, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles. It affects everyone running uh, a vehicle relying on that technology. Okay, we're coming very close to the end. We might just take an extra two or three minutes. Dan O'Brien is the chief economist here at the IIEA brings it back to, I suppose, basics. Um, we think about next winter. If it comes to rationing next winter, which high energy consuming sectors or industries in Europe could be slowed or shut down with least impact for the rest of the economy? That's an extremely 
Um, no pressure. <laughs> it's an extremely good question. And I mean, I think it's important that, um, you know, countries will need to look carefully at their, you know, their large gas consumers uh, and, and think through, you know, some of the economic considerations, some of the social considerations about any potential shortfalls um, in, in supply. Um, the recent experience in there has, has been a bit salutary in terms of the way that you can think that through. And um, because um, you can have all sorts of knock-on effects from a shortage of gas that are really non-intuitive. Uh, one of the things that we saw last year um, when there was a, a first sort of set of gas, you know, high gas prices in the UK, um, you had um, gas, a few um, fertilizer manufacturers um, reduced their production. And one of the byproducts of that was that they stopped um, producing CO2. That CO2 uh, was then used in food processing. And so you had a sort of series of, of, of non-intuitive knock-on effects of a shortage of gas. And so thinking those through um, is extremely important, but it's also quite difficult. And uh, so we're encouraging uh, countries to, uh, to think these things through in advance. So we need, to be, we need to be ready for a range of eventualities, even as we hope for, for, for the best outcomes. We've got loads of questions. We're not going to get to them all. Um, and just a um, word of advice for questioners, the shorter they are, the better, because the easier they are to read and to turn around. But anyway, if the questions are excellent. It's just some of them, perhaps, um, if they were a little bit tighter, they'd have a better chance of getting on. Um, Andrew McGeady, um, I suppose this is, again, as much of a, a sort of a statement, perhaps expressing frustration as it is a, que a question, although he ends with a question. On the supply side, this week, the Guardian newspaper reported that, quote, the dozen biggest oil companies are on track to spend $103 million a day for the rest of the decade, exploiting new fields of oil and gas that cannot be burned if global heating is to be limited to well under two degrees centigrade. How can we stop this? which is, a, I suppose, a, a cry in terms of, you know, how, how can this be stopped? Um, will it be stopped? Um, should it be stopped? From our perspective, um, the most effective solutions lie on the demand side. Mm. Um, I do not personally see that there is a very convincing theory of change around transitions that relies on shortages and very high fuel prices in order to to force change through the system. Um, those high fuel prices, as we can see today, are, are regressive. They hit the vulnerable very hard. Um, and, uh, and that has all sorts of implications then for the, also for the political economy of, uh, of transitions. Um, so my, my answer to that question is, how can you stop uh, these decisions? Um, you can, I mean, we have in our power as consumers and as governments uh, to make those decisions uneconomic. Uh, we can we can move away from those fields. Um, we have the technologies to do so, and and I think that would that that for me is is the most effective and lasting uh, response to, uh, to 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 things like that. Great. Listen, we're going to wrap it up there. Although there are so many more questions and so many things we could discuss, it's been absolutely fascinating hour. And thank you so much um, for. The presentation, um, first of all, looking at the 10-point plan as well, and people can look at that, presumably on the IEA uh, website, they can certainly get, get access to us as we have. Um, and um, it's it's it really is, it's it, it repays study because it, 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 it does show a series of measures and decisions that can realistically be taken that will actually address the uh, you know the immediate crisis that that's there, um, but you've also you know ranged across a whole load of much broader questions. And thank you for being willing to do that and fielding all of the questions from from uh, all sorts of perspectives. It's been extremely interesting, and I think it just demonstrates again how complex the transition is and will be, and this sort of long glide path to. 2050 uh, uh, and beyond, you know that it's 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 just full of complexity um and also the i was minister for energy here in, up to may 2016 that's six years ago around about this week if i look forward six years we'll just be just hitting 2030 you know so we all have different ways of just working out time and, and timelines and 
you know, um, how quickly things have to happen now. Um, and I know that the IEA um, will be at the um, centre of all of that debate and all of that decision making. And it's been just terrific to have you here today um, to uh, take us through um, the, you know, the work that you're doing and to and to answer the questions. So um, once again, thanks very much um, to Tim Gould for being with us. Um, thank you all for your attendance and for your interest and for your questions. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing you all uh, soon. Have a good day.